Good morning, Joel. How are you? I'm very well. How are you, Richard? You're very good. Thanks ever so much for joining us on this live. Uh, I really appreciate that. Can you tell us exactly where you are sat right now on the planet? Uh, <laughs> I'm sat in uh, my orifice um, in my home um, in Manchester. In Manchester, in in England, in England, obviously for our international yes, viewers. Yeah. So not Manchester yeah. by the sea in um, Massachusetts. So uh, you are, but however, right? So you're based in Manchester in the north of England. If people don't know exactly where that is, if you're from outside <laughs> the UK. It, Manchester's in the northern part of England. Yes, it has the famous football teams and lots of music going on and all the rest of it. But you might notice that Joel doesn't have a Manchester accent. And he's not originally from Manchester. So, Joel, tell me, tell me why you're in Manchester. What what has made you uh, make the, the that big city your home? Um, I did just my old job before I was a photographer. Um, I. I first half of my life in London, spent a lot more since then down there. Um, but over a period of time, um, I don't know, it's strange. I think probably who can afford to live in London? Um, it's very expensive um, and I can just about afford to live here. So it's uh, it's relatively uh, an improvement. Uh, my old job, I was a retailer, so I, was, I had nothing to do with photography at all. Um, and it just sort of slid across into photography over time. Um, so I was working a shop and then I was working from home, um, and started doing more photography. So, um, but I like it up here. It's nice. The weather's always good, as you know, famously. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit rainy, but you know, I love, I love Manchester. I love the Northern cities and, but the, you know, everything in, especially in the UK is very London centric. So this is why I was yes. sort of going in that direction of asking you, uh, you know, you're, you're up there, you're making a living, you're a press photographer, you're obviously doing commissions and all kinds of stuff as well. And that's, that's really cool. Um, you know, I, I'm really interested to find out, you, you know, the, um, is there a photography scene in Manchester that's vibrant that you're part of? Not like London. Um, it's interesting, actually, in a week's time, um, there's a camera club have invited Dennis Thorpe uh, oh, okay. to talk about his life and career. And I just randomly bumped into when he's sort of interweaved world. I, I, a friend was who is now a, a music promoter was putting on a gig uh, with a band who I also know. Um, both through photography, but from my days as as a as a sort of a street photographer, as an amateur, just sort of enjoying it. Um, and one of the guys there was talking about photography because he saw I had cameras with me. I was taking pictures. And he said, "Oh, uh, we've got this guy called Dennis." And I went, Dennis thought, "Really? Okay." Um, so I managed to sort some tickets for that. Um, but there's Red Eye, um, which I'm not really plugged into, but I know there's a lot of stuff, sort of you know, hot house events and that sort of things. Yeah, they look um, like they're quite online and, and I follow them and that, that seems to be quite they seem to be quite regular in, in doing things and uh, you know it, it, a point is that in the, in the other cities London has got always got lots and lots of stuff going on in it so it's just a way of finding out you know how do you keep engaged with photography in general I assume it's social media and all the regular avenues um, social media I, I i mean I, i'm sort of jealous a bit of london to be honest and, and i'm always sort of i mean i go down there a lot um and obviously i'm from there and i've got family there um but i still see things like um photo forum and so on i was thinking oh, i'd like to hear them speak i'd like to see them talk about those photos that i remember at the time um and so i always feel that there's not so much press photography it's it's and and that's i guess if you want to talk about the capital of press photography it is london um yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it, but, it, you know, we the reason for doing a lot of these lives, we want to touch a lot of bases with a lot of different people from different locations. OK, we've got a lot of people coming on board now saying hi. Uh, we've got a cool. bit of Sean Curry saying hey. A bit of hey, Rob Sean. Joseph saying hello. Gareth Davies, hi all. Ian Price, hi. Dave Nash, hello. hi Richard and Joel. Thanks all for joining us so far. If you've got any questions for Joel, that you would like to ask, please start putting them in the comments underneath while we, we're just waiting for a few more people to kind of get on board and then we'll start the Q&A properly. Um, Joel, I need to know uh, a little bit more about you because uh, it, 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 this is a good example of trying to meet up with photographers virtually and you only, I've met a bunch yesterday and the only times that I've ever seen them is this. 
so I went up to a few of them going are you so and so and they're like yeah yes um, so we've always got that kind of thing so you know can you sort of explain your um your background did you have a creative family have you got photographers in your family did you get passed down a camera did you is there some sort of um uh, in your genes is there a, a <laughs> photography gene not really no um uh, i mean my dad's an engineer uh first and foremost and i guess i get my sort of technical interest from him on that score um it's funny i was uh, I, I stopped off. I had a job in London very early morning um, last week. And so I thought I'll go down the night before, get the cheaper train because it's too expensive on, on, the, on the morning in the rush hour um, and stay over with my mum and dad. Um, and when I arrived, I thought I'll just check that I've got everything with me. And of course, was missing something. And I'd come on the train and I had a broken flash. And because I had access to my dad's garage and, you know, 87 years of, of stockpiling tools, um, I was able to affect a very good repair. Um, so I think that definitely comes from him. Um, not really, no, no interest in photography beyond, you know, he had a camera. Um, um, my mum is a historian and uh, a writer. Um, and again, so it's, it's a different sort of creativity, I guess. Um, I reckon that you've yeah, got no. a bit from both sounds like you've got uh you know your mum's got a lot of creativity you know you see that quite quite often um my I, my mum is hugely creative like hugely um but my dad worked in insurance but then i asked him to help me with a few things that were like my graphic design thing at school and stuff like that and he suddenly would draw these really ornate <laughs> illustrations and i'm like where did that come from so that's sort of where I asked for my dad was a bit of a um, um, maybe he had a bit of photography in him kind of he, he always owned cameras always it was always cameras you know dad always had a camera yeah. kind of thing so so um, look we're gonna we're gonna get started Elliot hello how are you it's good that you have joined us today hello Ross how are you um, if you've got any questions please do start popping them in the comments underneath Joel is a very well-traveled photographer uh, in his press career, so we're going to really get to it. Joel, why photography? Oh, that's, um, probably um, it, it's more about the interest in the current affairs that I photograph than about the photography. I think the one led to the other. Um, I was back in... 20 years ago, I was really interested in current affairs documentary, but TV mostly. Um, and I studied that. I studied TV production. Um, and that didn't work out. And I went back to my first job, which was as a retailer. Um, and then I just picked up a camera and I thought, this is much easier because I'm on my own. I'm not reliant on someone else to let me down or me to let someone else down. If it succeeds or fails, it's off my own success or failure. Um, so I can take the credit and I can keep quiet if I if I cock it up um, and it was just fun and so I was just I was just doing street photography on weekends and messing around with a camera sort of really late sort of mid 2000s sort of 2006 2007 um, was the first time I really sort of picked up a camera and started figuring out how it works what does aperture do you know okay if I take it out of automatic and use different shutter speeds and different apertures what happens um so i think a lot of people sort of i've been listening to all the sort of the the, the other uh talks you've given and obviously you, you speak you you hear of other photographers and, and and see them speak and they always talk about you know at the age of 11 my father passed me this this whole girl or whatever it was and it was my first experience and it was a magical transformative moment in the dark room and i had none of that at all so um <laughs> yeah i almost i mean i i so would you say that you're self-taught then? Yeah, um, I think that's true though, of a lot. I think that's true of a lot of people though, isn't it? I mean, I've had tons of advice and tons of sort of, you know, help along the way. Um, but yeah, everything that I know in terms of how to make a camera work is pretty much, yeah. It's but now it's easy, error. isn't it? Falling because, over. Well, exactly, but you can, it's so easy with digital because you can <laughs> mess it up a hundred times and it doesn't cost you a penny. Um, and you can also go on YouTube and, you know, there'll be 20 different people telling you how to do the same thing 20 different ways. And one of them will work for you. 
Mm. Um, so, and then just go out and mess it up a couple of hundred times. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit like riding a bike, taking the stabilizers off, falling over a lot, and then getting back on it again. I keep saying that to a lot of like the younger photographers, students. Oh, I've got to learn this, got to learn that. It's just no good unless you don't go out and just keep taking pictures and making complete, make it a complete mess of it, and then starting again, kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, that's it. That's very good to to hear. That, uh, and I'm still another... making a complete mess of it as well, so that's fine, yeah. you know, because it's sort of, it's 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 every time you do a job, you sort of think, oh god, I missed that, I forgot that, I didn't do that. Why did I mess up that shot? That would have been lovely if only I'd done that. It's every time, yeah. so yeah, and that's yeah. part of the fun. Well, it's mm. part of the fun unless like you um, are on commission for somebody. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> then I, it's I was, a slight. No, but this, this came up this week, and I just I, uh, commissions sort of feel really stifling. Mm. Um, I because there's that sense of obligation and that pressure to sort of deliver something of of, of a standard, um, and it's weird because when I started, all I wanted was to get commissions. That was like that was the ambition, um, but I don't enjoy doing them anywhere near as much as as if I'm specking, if I'm doing stuff off my own back. Yeah, yeah, yeah I I get it completely. You you it's just you you just haven't got that freedom. And you, you're oh. just photographers. I think in general are, are, are renegades and uh, <laughs> a bit rebel. So you know, there's this kind of I'm not going to be told what to do kind of thing about uh, photographers, and and then yeah. you have to take a commission, and then the, they have to like tell you what to do, and that's that doesn't always work. I think that there's a um, you know from what I'm I'm hearing, you know, being self-taught and and you going through that process that that will resonate with a lot of photographers. But have you got any photographers that you looked at when you were starting out and learning who you um, actually focused on? Yeah, um, I mean, there's I guess probably the first person that I really sort of emotionally connected with as a photographer was probably um, Arthur Felig, uh, Ouija. Wow. Um, just because. It's, I mean, you can, even now, if you look at his pictures, it doesn't matter that they're black and white. It doesn't matter that it was sort of 70 years ago. It looks fresh. It looks like it was taken yesterday. It's, there's such an impact and an immediacy about everything that he did. It's so cold and hard and, mm. and yeah, and certainly detached, but it's, it, it still hits you. And that was the sort of stuff when I looked at it and thought, crikey this is you know I, I would like to do this you know how exciting is this and then you sort of you know the legendary story about sort of having the scanner and driving around at night the sort yeah. of the night crawler sort of thing but the, the the actual story behind it is really really cool um and it does sound cool and you know especially in those days in a city like new york yeah it's so so that was the sort of the first time i sort of really sort of thought that is that's amazing you know um, no laptop, but he was developing in the boot of his car and then, you know, just just brilliant. Um, you know, almost as efficient as we are now, really. <laughs> yeah, completely. I mean, you only have to see that he was um, what he was doing. And we would just let's say now we would walk past a car of a photographer and they're sat on their on their uh, passenger seat is laptop cables and all the other paraphernalia and they're just wiring and doing all the same thing i don't it you know it hasn't changed that that dramatically over like eight i mean when when was ouija shooting that that would have been in the 20s wouldn't it the prohibition era and uh you know there was a lot of mob murders violence. and yeah. mob violence and that kind of stuff so um yeah I, I mean that always interests me it doesn't surprise me at all that you've been influenced by alpha felic <laughs> That's for sure, okay. <laughs> because actually it leads really, really well into the first part of uh, what I wanted to talk to you about was that uh, mm, I would say recently, not too long ago, that uh, you had uh, some stuff, in uh, an image in particular, but from a series and a sequence that went very viral for you. And um, the... Uh, I think it was just genius, right? So it, uh, the way I saw it was, I think it was in one of the broadsheets. They all started publishing it, and and I was like, bloody hell, that's brilliant. And then, and I was like, oh no, it's Joel. No, I didn't mean that. Uh, I looked at it, and then Joel, I saw your credit. I was like, oh my god, that's amazing. And it was the shot of, I think it's the lady in the street in Manchester laying on the floor uh, on a night out. 
a, a man. Um, it was a man on the floor, and yeah. uh, it's a, a big tableau, really, of, um, a, you know, it's this frozen in time shot of, yeah, the man is out of his face. There seem to be paramedics knocking around, and, and this yeah. is the golden ratio. And uh, <laughs> so could you please explain a little bit further um, how that came to be, why you were there, uh, what happened and the, the story surrounding it because I really want people to go and have a look at it. it it's brilliant and to be honest not the first time you've done it either but that's the uh, this is the one I want to talk about so if you could fill us in that'd be amazing. Yeah I, I listen so I mean this was one of the things that sort of why what I do is, is such a, a joy I guess because this was the thing I did as a pleasure almost or this was the thing I did back in the sort of the late 2000s as a, as a sort of a hobby to get myself into photography um, and partly I was just looking um, so this guy whose band was playing that I was talking about in the introduction which is sort of irrelevant but he was doing sort of street photography on a night out in Leeds um, Stephen Griffin he's called he plays uh, he's got a band now called Interrobang um, right yep I'm, I'm on um, Spotify right now hang on <laughs> Interrobang it's got uh, Dust, Dunstan Bruce out of Chumbawamba. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's it's perfect for men of your and my age. Um, <laughs> right, okay. Angry, angry middle-aged men. Um, it, so he was doing this night stuff in Leeds, and I I, I saw it at a, again. I was a hobbyist, and we, there was this Flickr meet in Leeds in the late two thousands, when Flickr was a really good thing. It was really big, and he was his friend Lloyd was talking about these pictures that they were doing on a night and I thought again like the sort of the Ouija thing I thought oh, that's amazing I want to do that mm. and I could do that in Manchester um, and actually I saw that before I saw famously um, Masic's, Masic's work I get his name pronounced right uh, Masic Darkovitz a Polish photographer who famously published Cardiff After Dark oh yes I saw Sorry. Stuff. yeah yeah so but I saw that stuff before his stuff and I thought yeah. I'm gonna try and do that so in, in, hang on, Joel, in the in the timeline then uh cardiff mm. it's cardiff after dark yeah 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 when um was that like a I, year I, or two before you would you were doing a bit in manchester because I, I seem to no, remember was, the book was published later on i mean Manchester was still doing it as a photographer but yeah. the book came later yeah so fantastic the, the book was published. It? Uh, brilliant uh, it's, you know it's it's a bookshelf keeper um yes so I, I just thought, I, I, you know, I'm doing lots of stuff by day and I'm doing nothing at night. And this would be, I can't just be taking pictures in low light of buildings because that's boring. There needs to be a, a subject. There needs to be a reason to take the pictures. And this is it. This is, this is entertaining. Um, and so I just started going out and doing it with uh, really inadequate equipment. But that was perfect because it taught me everything that I needed to know about how to shoot totally manually in low light without a flash. Um, and I just every every weekend I was going out and sometimes middle of the week. And if there was an event on, I'd go to that. And if there was anything that was happening at night in a public place, I would go and photograph it over and over and over again. Um, what kind of kit started, are you going out with, Joel? Um, at that point, I had. Um, well, we're having a bit of Manchester Wi-Fi issue here if you're watching this. Shouldn't be. OK, we're back. We're back in the room. OK, sorry about that. Um, That's OK. Is it, is it all right for you now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, um, I, I, I had a, F a Canon 400D and a Tamron 28 to 300 <laughs> F 4.5 to 6.3 with two filters right. on the front for no good reason, um, just to make it fuzzier and, and worse. The perfect night camera, um, yeah. Yeah, it was awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, but I very quickly, you, you, I sort of think now every time of every time I missed a shot because I felt the kit wasn't good enough, I went out and bought a better bit of kit, um, which is, seems like a really indulgent way of doing it. But it was what sort of it was what sort of pushed me to to sort of up the kit and then yeah realize that actually yeah you can't get anything at, at f five point six. On a, on, a, on a camera that is awful at 800 ISO in street light. <laughs> no, <laughs> and it's soft anyway. Um, so then I had a 2472.8, which was a lot better. Yeah. And a 40D, 
which was a lot better. So you kind and of eventually I, as you're going, yeah? Yeah, and eventually, and that's what forced me to get the, the, the famous 5D2 Canon, which was the one that all the low-light photographers wanted at the time, the Canon 5D2, just because yeah. it, it just, it was, it was, um, it was, it was the best you could get for low light. And that was like, whoa, I can, I can shoot at ISO 3200 here um, and suddenly freeze action, which I couldn't do before. It was a bit, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I was, so I was doing that for years and years and years. And when I sort of became a press photographer, as in a press photographer, so I was still working really um, as another job and sliding into it as a freelancer and probably upsetting all the, uh, you know, turning up on jobs as a hobbyist with, with yeah, becoming one of those people that you end up hating. Um, <laughs> I, the, I, I, the first people to ever give me a chance were London News Pictures, LNP. Um, and this is back in 2010, I think. Um, and I started looking at what they were publishing and just what they were using. And I realized that there was, sometimes there was a market for stuff that you'd already photographed that might tell a story to go with something else. And it was the first print use I think I ever got on a spec photo was I saw this story about, you know, alcohol at night. And, you know, there's always a story about alcohol at night. But at that point, I didn't sort of really connect with that. And I just thought, well, I've got a couple of pictures of alcohol at night. I'll send it into LNP and see what happens. And it was used full page in the mirror the next day for that story. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I got a full page picture from, you know, that, um, from stuff that I'm doing anyway, because it's fun. What else is there? And then it sort of obviously evolved from there. So the penny dropped. And then you yes. were you you did you like then ramp it up, so the the quantity of events and stuff that you were turning up the penny drop there you were like oh my god this is this is actually something here, and then you took off into the night you with your uh, <laughs> night, with your night cloak on, and yes. uh, and helmet and uh, that <laughs> superhero gear that you wear with your five D and you would yeah. were you were you really scaling up the amount of events that you were doing you just really saw that there was an opportunity there. I was really fortunate because I was working from home and I was working a job which as long as I got the job done, I could shuffle it around and do it early in the morning, late at night. So I started sort of doing that and sort of yeah, making work suit my hobby. <laughs> Um, yeah. And so not just at night, but a day if something happened or if something broke and I could get away, I would just go out and do it. And again, this is, you know, I have to say this is this is thanks to LNP because, you know, they were saying, oh, this has happened and really sort of I mean, they were pushing me. You know, they wanted the pictures, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's good business. But at the same time, it sort of motivated me and it made me look at what was a news story and what wasn't. And sort of, you know, I learned a new sense through that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I understand. So, you know, when something broke that was significant, I would go out and photograph that as well um, and slowly sort of learn with each job. It was like, OK, well, I really messed that up and I really could have done that better. And my yeah. captions were awful on that. And so, uh, you know, but each time it was like, OK, for next time or maybe I should prepare it this way on my laptop for future and slowly but surely sort of just just sort of refined it, I guess. Um, because you, yeah, you know, you 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 were a news photographer, and you know what it's like. It's sort of it's you you, you want to be sharp. It's not just that you need to be sharp; you want to be sharp. Because it's so frustrating when things don't literally go like clockwork perfectly, bang, 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 bang. Um, so that really sharpened it up a lot for me. Um, so uh, we've got a few more people coming on board. Hello, Keith Whitmore. Hello from Norfolk. He says, "Thanks very much." Norfolk. Keith. Hello, Norfolk. Hello to all you truckers out there. Oh, <laughs> David uh, hi Joel and Richard at what point did you feel you could produce a good image and how did this change how you felt about your future in the industry that's a good question that's a very good question um I think it's 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 I, I it's like it's steps of you know when I conquered flash that was a step. Do you know what I mean? When I finally understood how to make flash work and how to control it rather than it control me and not be satisfied with the result, that was a step. But I think it's also so years ago, I sort of read about the Dunning Kruger effect. And I think this is a tough one for photographers because 
there's very little opportunity to get some genuine qualified advice and constructive criticism. People are either very coy about wanting to criticize because who am I to criticize you? Um, everyone's different, it's your photo. And it's, you know, it's something that's also creative as well as sort of, you know, needing to deliver something. It's very hard to criticize something that's creative because it's your creation, how can I criticize it? Um, so you have to be so self-aware and so self-critical. And so there've been times when I thought, oh, I'm brilliant at this, I'm great, you know, I'm the world's best. And then, of course, you know, realized actually six months later, God, I'm awful. I'm just rubbish. Yeah. And that's been because I've suddenly become aware. Oh, crikey, look at what I shot and look what he shot. And how did I miss all that? Um, you know, I used to, if I was ever on a job, I mean, Getty is brilliant for that. Because if you're ever standing next to the Getty photographer, you can see what they filed when you get home at the end of the day, you think I missed all of this and this and this. And so in the Northwest, you've got Chris Furlong, who is, you know, a photographer I massively love and just takes mm. beautiful pictures, you know, can make, can make beauty out of nothing. Um, and so, you know, I'd look at his stuff and I thought, God, how did I, how did I miss that? How did he see that? Or how did he do that? I mean, he was doing things like, you know, when there was, when there was um, uh, scrums, and we were all getting in there with as wide as possible, as front as possible. He'd stand back with a telephoto and drag the shutter and do the catch flash thing with the subject sort of in profile and very prettily lit up just side on. And you think, I've never, I've, you know, I've seen that effect on red carpets. How do I do that? And, you know, then I'll add that to my toolkit. And then when I'm struggling for an idea next time, maybe I'll try that. Um, so I think, I think, the long answer to the question is I, I, I'm still not there yet, but at least now I can turn out a job and get, you know, a clean photograph that is acceptable, that probably won't sell. Um, it's some people make it look easy. I, I find it very hard. I have to I, I can do good, but I have to work very, very hard. I have to mm. you know, arrive early, finish late and take lots of pictures and look around me all the time. And if I don't really focus hard and work incredibly hard, I find my work is a bit average. But you give you see you give 100 percent when you when you're there. When Dave, I can. <laughs> yeah, Dave, mate, you know, that's a That's a really good question, David because I uh, feel the same as Joel. I don't think that I can produce a good image still because I was always told that it was, um, you're only as good as your last picture. And that yes. was drilled into me from when I started. And um, I would come back right from the beginning up until like, yes, like yesterday, where I'm kicking myself now, uh, where it would be, well, you know, you think you're good, do you? It was that continual thing. Oh, you think you're good, do you? And you've come away with something. You think, oh, that's really great, that picture I took. And it was a really good way of having beating that out of me, that I'm not uh, – the next level is there. The next ladder step is here, and I must push on. I must give 100%. Every time I turn up, don't rest on my laurels and make things better. I always did it did with – um, Did you get that from a local picture editor, from a local paper? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's gone now. And I yeah. worry about, you know, who's coming in now? Who's going to get someone who knows about photography and will make sure that the good pictures are used and the bad pictures are not used, who will train those next generation of photographers? They've all gone. Um, and, and this is why it's so much harder, I think, for guys now getting into, into photography who want to be press photographers, mm. is there's no training path. There's no NCTJ photojournalism. There's mm. no local paper with a local paper editor who might just buy your first picture for you and encourage you and then start really saying okay well you can get your first job here helping out and work next to the old guy who's been doing yeah. it for decades and knows every that's all gone and mm. i think for someone coming into the industry now it's going to be very very hard indeed yeah yeah uh, also there there is the those knockbacks aren't there and i think the knockbacks are more important uh, really than the taking the pictures taking pictures will be for a very long time that's the long game but the short term game is getting the knockbacks and and getting a bit of a, a kicking occasionally and I think that that is fundamental to you raising your game every single time I do it continually to myself I don't know about you Joel but I will come back and I've taken some pictures of something and I'll look at them in the screen or I'll get the film back and I'll be livid livid that I 
know that at the time I could see something happening or the corner of my eye, and that just makes me raise my game again. It's I, I suppose it's the inner picture editor in my head going, uh, that's crap, <laughs> you know, get out there again and do it again. It's I, I think you're completely right about um students and younger photographers coming in now they're not going in that path got some good questions coming in here i just want to just it. on Thanks, that Dave. knockback thing as well just very yeah. quickly because yeah. i think that's really important as well is is self-confidence um mm. you have to be a little bit cocky to think that you're good enough to send this to someone who might use it um yeah but at the same time with that self it's, 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 it's a total contradiction you have to be confident enough to think this is good enough to use but at the same time be aware when it isn't um and those knockbacks it's it's it is a, a bash to your confidence and you need to have massive determination to then say i'm going to get back on the horse and have another go at that and i yeah. mess that. i mean there's still things <clears> that you sort of think not just the shots that you wish you didn't miss that you did but just events or times and i think I, I it's almost like it haunts you in a way that you sort of think yeah. i never did that i never got that i should have done that i should have been there and i missed it um which is again why it's i, th I think if you if you if you worry about that it's so much easier to shoot on spec than it is to do a commission yeah, um, sorry, I, was, yeah. I, I was really lucky i worked for an agency and they covered a multitude of stuff and because i was one of the lower rung photographers i got sent out on the crap jobs but in yeah. actual fact the crap jobs turned out to be let's say art art jobs that were like to do with arts and um uh you know if, if people were having a um uh an auction sale or something like that i was always sent to those kind of jobs and there was a few things uh, but the funny thing was i was always turning up on a job where all the broadsheet guys were being sent to do those kind of jobs Right. So I'd sit there and I'd be watching like Brian Harris and Sean Smith and people like that mm -hmm. on every job. And I'd be like, my God, I'd be just literally watching them at every move. What um, an education. And then taking, well, yeah, because I'd take all my pictures and I'd come back to the office and I'd think, oh, my God, I've done quite well there. I thought I've, I've done something really nice. And I put together quite an artistic set of pictures and the rest of it. And then open The Guardian and The Independent the next day and go, oh, bollocks <laughs> just Used, awesome... beautifully large on the page yeah. and sort of you know <laughs> correctly bylined and, and yeah. elegantly sort of laid out um I, yeah. it's interesting because um you were talking to um uh, grant wasn't it a couple of days ago yes yeah and grant he said Scott. something brilliant yeah. at the end of it he talked about how people who commission need to get you know support the photographer and say look this is the guy i commissioned i stand by his work I back what he's done and yeah. I take responsibility for making it work. And I thought that was such, I, God, that was, it was like music, you know, yeah, it was, good it was such a that, good thing to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so and, look, and, I, and, I, and it would be lovely if, if all those, sorry. Sorry, you go, carry on, Joel. Carry on. No, I'm, Flying you're blathering on. are you uh, i didn't mean to interject i was just going to try and uh skip through some we've got quite a few people leaving uh messages and i just really wanted to sort of catch up with them in between uh questions because we'll carry on with this so um this is good dave dave gold hi dave uh love the night series great to see that image remember seeing joel on bbc breakfast talking about it fantastic joel's uh, joel is famous on many levels right Dave Gould uh, also another question have you had an exhibition of your night series yet it would be great to see I second that I think you should pull your finger out Joel get that on a wall somewhere okay let's talk about doing something let's do that it uh, it'll be great I'd love to. Be, I, I, you be, know I never thought I would care about printing stuff but actually now I really I, I, I would love to do that yeah now this is the comment that I was really interested in Pete, Pete McLean sorry I'm late Thanks, well, where Pete. You, where you been, Pete? You know, we were just killing time until you got here. Uh, Rebecca, Michael, hello from London. Joel. Having salted porridge. <laughs> Joel, I love your work. Amazing, right? That was really nice. Thanks, Thank for Rebecca. Dave Hoffman, welcome to my kitchen, Joel. How are you doing, David? Has he, has he finished Hope the tiling yet? Okay. <laughs> that tiling has been a, a constant thing. If people are watching and they don't know who Dave, David Hoffman is, please go and Google him. Go and look at his website, go and find him on social media and follow him. Legendary photographer, David Hoffman. Uh, and and right, doing he, all the sort of social issues and the demos and stuff that I yeah. really like doing now. And yeah. I, I admit, I wasn't aware of his work when I started, 
but I love seeing him talk about it and post it now because yeah. it's exactly the stuff that, that really interests me. He does a lot of stuff around policing and social well, He's putting issues. out loads more of the archive on his I, social channels just now. More, yeah. please. And the stories yeah. behind them as well are just so interesting. Yeah, it's very, very, very good. And a very good learning curve, actually, looking at how he does stuff. Um, so that's great. Uh, Pete, Pete McLean, does being as handsome as you are help with getting an <laughs> eye line with subjects? I think that Pete has gone full groom. He's full grooming. Dave Hoffman's still working on his uh, tiling, just so, so we can fill in the, the viewers on David Hoffman's kitchen. Uh, Keith Whitmore yeah. says, totally agree about the local press situation. I think that that might resonate with a lot of people in our industry. So um, yeah. listen, if you have got any more questions for Joel, please do pop them in the comments and uh, I will rattle my way through them. Uh, and that is a, a massive help. So let, let's go back into the the, uh, the Manchester golden ratio situation. <laughs> Went on a little bit of a tangent. So, uh, it, you know, obviously you've mastered, you're mastering night photography, you're going through um, photographing a lot of things and especially around uh, the, this, you know, the British drinking culture specifically is what you were really in a, in a wider sense covering. So we all know about yeah. British drinking culture and that kind of stuff, but also there was a very ladette kind of feel to it which was which has always been a, a thing was you know they the tabloids tend to focus on females out drinking and yeah. um so you know has that is that still a thing that you're going out and covering or is this has been a sequence now that you're going to put to bed or are you just um, going to continually keep keep doing night stuff I mean, it's interesting. I've been, again, I've been fortunate enough, I guess, to be indulgent. Just you said about the Ladette thing and the tabloids. And I, I, you know, I confess the first couple of times I did it when I thought I'm shooting for newspapers, I fell into that, taking a picture of, you know, a woman wearing not many clothes. And I didn't really like myself for doing it. And I stopped doing it. And I've been lucky because I've actually done better stuff for not doing that that's taken me further. I think if I'd carried on doing it the same way, um, I'd probably still be getting hits in, 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 you know, in, in the star and the mail and places like that. Um, but I wouldn't be happy with myself, but also I would, it wouldn't have taken me where it took me if I, if I didn't sort of start thinking, actually do this for the reason you enjoyed doing it in the first place. If you're shooting it as a street picture, shoot it wide where you can look for the stories rather than just a square picture of someone isolated from the background. Yeah. Yeah, completely. I, so I, you know, I, I, it's it's I, I I found that to be a trap, and I'm much happier not doing that. Um, so it's interesting what you say about the ladette thing, and and I think that you know you talk about that picture, you come back to that again. I think that's that's justification of not shooting it in that way. Um, you know, it, it's it's that's not what that picture's about at all. Um, so I'm pleased about that. Um, sorry, what was your question? I, I diverted. <laughs> It was more about the, you know, where you're going now. Have you put it to bed? Have you put that? I've, have you put that period of time to bed, or are you going to continue doing your doing night work? So you, yeah. I, I, I'm going with this because we were talking about Bill Brandt the other day, and Bill Brandt for me was uh, how I came into knowing about Bill Brandt was all his night photography, and right. obviously you brought up Ouija at the beginning, and I could see there being a bit of a. A connection there where you know that, that this could be a continual theme for you is shooting night stuff you know and a, a continual sequence of of events uh, there's always going to be drinking culture in in england but um it's how far you want to carry it on doesn't it no that's right the story doesn't end I, I i must admit i've shot less of it since as you keep referring to it as golden ratio um partly because i i sort of felt like i didn't want to be seen to be milking it oh we're going to rename the golden jolio okay <laughs> does that sound better i listen it's it's all music when you say it <laughs> um i interrupted uh, i'm sorry that's all right i'm, I'm crap at trying to think i'll tell you what um, I, I, we've got a few comments here that uh, dave hoffman says your picks are an inspiration to us all oh, that's, go that's, away, that's David. great that's very big praise. So um, there's also um, a, a very good point here because currently, you know, you're what if you're watching this uh, later, uh, we're currently on Friday the 18th, 2018. We have a royal wedding happening down in Windsor t tomorrow, actually. 
in, on the Saturday, which is Harry and Harry, uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And but Elliot Franks, he makes a good point that um, there's been a guy on the TV um, commenting for photographers and the, the for press photographers and paparazzi in general. Move over, George Bambi. We need a media to interview Joel when they need to speak to a professional press photographer. You're such a great ambassador for an industry. Now, I would thought about that, Joel. You're very um, chatty and vocal, and it, it would be a good thing for you to put yourself forward a little bit more to those kind of channels. I mean, not to, not to become a total talking head. I didn't mean it in that way. But, you know, to give a structured view on what is actually going on out there when we're taking pictures, um, you know, in and we will come to this because you do cover a lot of news and political events as well. Uh, yeah. but, but press photography in general, we're in this influencer st stage where you've got a lot of people putting themselves out there to get on telly. And and I, I've sat there many times and gone, who is this person? I've and I see Sean said, who's George Bambi? Who's George Bambi? And he's a faker isn't he he's just a total fake um yeah and it is, it's, it's toe curling hearing yeah. him seeing him it's embarrassing i'd put my fist in my mouth um yeah. and it, it, it's it makes very entertaining tv i know um yeah but it it's does, embarrassing but it, it, it's, it's, it's just very it's, it's, very weird right it's, it was it's, very weird but then that's you know in that instance i don't want to talk about him too much but Okay. In Good. fact, it's uh, the BBC's fault for not researching who they're having mm. on as a talking head. A good example was the guy. Do you remember when they got that guy in who was um, – they got him in the, the studio. Engineer. Yeah, stuck him in the chair. It's a yeah, little bit like that. It's just legged it and gone, oh, and Googled the word paparazzi and gone, right, I'll ring him because we need someone on. And then he's on the Victoria Derbyshire show on the BBC News Channel, for Christ's sake. I mean, it's just – I, I, it's idiotic whatever was going yeah. on there i mean that's supposed to be a serious news program uh, i don't anyway. think they did it i don't think they did it by mistake i think it was cynical i think it was this will be entertaining this will get yeah. talked about and it is and it was and and that was the decision i think they could have quite easily have found a press photographer if they really wanted to uh, and well, they I, knew think, that. I think that you could be a little bit more interesting is my point <laughs> so look uh, what i would like us to do is just go uh, we're that's fantastic to find out about that night work. I love it. Okay. You must do a book and you must do an exhibition or something. Do a film, Joel. Do <laughs> do, <laughs> do all kinds of stuff. What I, no, it's a tw it's a twelve part TV show. <laughs> yeah. On Netflix. What I'd like 12 to do times is, 60 uh, minutes. can we just move on to the the because it uh, almost wa wa walks hand in hand when I look at your Instagram. So I look at Instagram and Twitter. You're big on Twitter. It's very good. If you want to go and follow, um, this is a, a good. This is one thing I do. Your um, well, thank social you. is Pixel Eight Photo, isn't it? F O T O, right? yeah. Right. That Brilliant. is Joel's Twitter and Instagram. So go and follow Joel, and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Because what Joel does is he shoots lots of night work, and he shoots his commissions and stuff like that and he shoots obviously a, a great deal of news now um what i would like to talk about next is uh your specific political photography okay and and i think you're, you're doing an excellent job very brave as far as i'm concerned because i've done i years and years ago i've done quite a bit of that and it was a bit hairy to say the least now you cover a lot of um let's talk about look, in the in the way that it's post brexit brexit and post brexits in uk really got tensions up uh, and yes. there was a, a bit of a rise of the far right uh they're a very small minority but they're quite loud and noisy now you've been covering a lot of events and uh, demos and anti demos and all that kind of stuff can you explain to us um, your motivation and how you work when you're covering a lot of these events um, because we see a lot of your stuff being published. I'd be really interested to find out all about that. Yeah, I mean, it's that's probably came about because it was, again, going back to sort of 2009 when I was sort of, you know, I still had a day job and photography. 
it was something that I could do on a weekend as a photography job that was accessible. It was fully public, so I didn't need special permissions or access. So I could just dive in and dive out, no obligations, um, and, and see how I got on. And then you've also got what's always interesting, which is in a picture, it's that thing about a single photo with strong emotion or strong action, which, you know, I... I, I I, I, you know, I, I really admire people who do, you know, you see the Cafe Royal books and these sort of documentary photos, which are not necessarily, there's usually one or two strong pictures, but there's these other quite nice loose frames, which are not a strong single picture, but which add to an overall story of the day. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with a, with a demo or whatever it is, you can sometimes get a single image that is strong, that is standout, that sort of sums up the day or that's just a particularly good photo. So the motivation was a bit cynical, I guess, in, in when I started in that, you know, this I can get some exciting photos here and, you know, if it kicks off, I'll get a bit of riot porn, that sort of thing. Um, but there's also sort of, you know, I'm interested in politics of all sorts. And so that gave it a much stronger edge for me. That gave me much stronger motivation to go out of my way to, to, to wake up at all hours of the morning, to get a train, to go to cities, Scotland, Wales, wherever, where there was going to be one of these events. And so I started following it and it was at exactly the same time that the, the EDL started becoming sort of a, you know, on the streets. Um, and once I started photographing them and then started photographing the counter protests around them, it became sort of, I can't miss one. I've, I've started doing this. I've got to keep doing it. Um, and then I started photographing the political conferences, which are <laughs> just, just to chip, <laughs> the just to chip in, that. Joel. Yeah. Can you can you just explain to the viewers because they might not understand some of the acronyms? Okay. So okay. The, the EDL and so on. If okay. the, because there we've got quite a, a varied viewer. Ship. obviously uk people might understand that a little bit maybe they're not so just be helpful um if you could just explain to them the specific those specific groups or their names so edl stands for english defense league um they're a street protest movement formed out of football <coughs> hooligans um this is this is their own way of describing themselves this is you know i think pretty unarguable uh, street protest movement and they they sort of started protesting in luton um at um fundamentalist islamists sort of on the streets i think it was it was a specific event it was a homecoming parade a, 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 a soldiers homecoming and these guys were out there with placards saying you know democracy go to hell and this sort of thing and they were outraged by this and started forming a movement and from there they obviously went city by city um, i say obviously if you followed the story um which i think in the uk you will have done um demonstrating in different cities often uh you know some sometimes really large protests sort of six seven thousand at the peak um and large counter protests which would often lead to sort of friction um and occasionally that would that would turn into a riot um and that was sort of that happened across england and, and in scotland and wales as well from about sort of 2009 to about sort of 2014-15 and then it sort of slowly that particular street movement sort of became a bit quieter and it still bubbles up again and I still feel like I have to keep, you know, so I follow the story now and the people involved in those movements have sort of moved on to other movements and I've sort of followed those other movements as well, just because you sort of, so yeah, I'm interested in the politics of it and I'm also interested in seeing how it changes over time, I guess. Um, have you had many hairy moments? Uh, I've had a few. Um, yeah. I've had a couple of broken glasses, a um, couple of black eyes. Um, so do you go in there, are you going in there equipped? I mean, even if a, a demo in London, there's a, there's a, a, a little bit of cycling helmet going on, and uh, yeah, uh, by everyone, by all all snappers, or or uh, you know a uh, you know a a a, 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 a grill free helmet, you know, the, like a skateboarder's helmet as part of a yeah. photographer's piece of kit to cover that, and and varying various. Uh, uh, stronger jackets and all that kind of stuff uh gloves uh, you know do all the basics just to cover your body uh, you know and and sometimes goggles and and that kind of stuff so how do you approach this where you are not only you're taking pictures but are you uh also are you shooting film at, i mean video at the same time are you doing are you shooting it on a on a wider sense where there'll be a lot of reactions you're going in and taking pictures but at the same time are you videoing your point of view over time i added uh, uh yeah a, a body cam 
Um, actually, that came about through the night work that I did the body cam. But I also knew at the time that I was getting it. I thought well, this will also be good for doing demos. And that's I wear that actually more for my own protection than anything. Um, there was an incident back in 2015. I was doing the night stuff um, and someone accused me of something and I wasn't able to directly disprove it. And although it went away, it upset me a great deal. And I thought, well, as much as I sort of if you wear a camera, and someone can see it, it changes the dynamic and you lose the ability to have a friendly, open, off the record conversation, which is a great shame. But the other side of that is when people see it, you see them and you see their eyes going backwards and forwards between you and, you know, so if, they, if they're, if they're going to come at you, they sort of rethink it. And it, it has a, I don't want to say a civilizing effect is the wrong word, but it has an effect. It changes people's behavior towards you. And it does make them sort of evaluate, you know, maybe I'm not going to punch this guy because, mm. you know, I, having said that, people don't see it sometimes and they still go right ahead. Um, so mm. I, I don't like that I wear it because I think it, it changes the dynamic. It means I can't have a, I've had people say to, to me, you know, at, at locations and I can completely understand it. I'd like to talk to you about this, but I don't want to be recorded. Mm. And I can sort of flap it down and sort of, but it's sort of the opportunity is missed. So I, I, I sort of regret it, but feel it's a necessity now in some situations. So yeah, certainly in, in those situations, if I, if I worry it's going to kick off or there's a chance it might, I'll be wearing it. Um, sometimes it's just personal, you know, it's just nice to have a record of an event. Sometimes it's a very useful way of being, a, you know, you want to be able to shoot a bit of video. Well, I can just put the cameras down and stand there like that. And, and you know, point yeah. like a human uh, dolly. Um, like an and, Apache and, helicopter. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know yeah, how. I understand. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so I've got I've got it here. As prepared. Are you still there? You've frozen on me. Have I lost you? Have I lost me? Has it gone? Oh, dear. Okay, we're back. Have back you lost me? Room. Are we yeah, back in the room? We're back in the room. I, at your prompting, so that people don't think I'm this. Uh, <laughs> I've got my uh, demonstration. Okay, so, so what this is got a GoPro Hero Four by the look of it, yeah. Uh, it's a three HD, and I've sort of done a couple of modifications just to make it work for me. I think it's what's yeah. got to be comfortable for you. This is a three, and I've got a chest harness. And what I've done is I've sort of very crudely stitched on two clips, so that I can sort of put it over my head and clip it on side by side. Yeah. The idea being, if you have to wear it, you can't slip your camera straps inside it. Okay. And so they get in the way, it gets in the way. But also it means if you're not carrying a camera bag, you, your straps are loose. So it serves as both a thing to hold the camera straps to your body. So if someone whips by and tries to yank a camera off you, it's held to your body through the loops on these. Because they only come with a clip on one side. So as I say, I've stuck a clip on the other side. And I've then put a big power bank on the end okay. of it. Yeah. Rather than use the battery, which only lasts sort of 20 minutes, and that will go eight hours. Um, and good. the biggest, fattest micro SD card. And that's brilliant because you just turn it on and then forget about it. Um, and so carry the, on through the day. The point, the point of using that, and I've seen other photographers who've, um, you know, been at lots of demos. And um, once it, the the weird thing is that a lot of people won't, so the general public won't really see this. They'll see the pictures have been used, but a photographer will go in uh, and there'll be a lot of crowd happening and it's a lot of elbows. But let's say one, a, a, a single demonstrator starts um, slapping and punching a photographer, then they like flies they will all join in all of a sudden and quite often than not you would not have captured that the photographer is unaware of it because you you've often got a camera to your eye and you're you're focused sort of this way but you you haven't got this all happening behind you you can't you can't see so the these pov cameras and the rest of it i've seen have been a, a have been a benefit in the uh, recording afterwards and, and you know assaults and all that kind of stuff yeah. i've i've them being a huge benefit uh and it's unfortunate i don't like to yeah 
it's it's as I say, it's it's purely if it gets out of hand, if someone accuses me of something or if, if there's a dispute over something, I don't tend to share it publicly because I feel it's like it's my record of the day and if nothing happens, I delete it anyway. Yeah. Um and because it's also, you know, I'm a journalist with a camera. And I guess all the people that I see, I want to be able to talk to them. I want them to be free to talk to me. I want them to trust me. I need them to trust me. And it's sort of it, it. So I need to be careful that I don't sort of betray that trust as well. So if someone says sidles up to me and has a quiet word in my ear, that's that's a quiet word in my ear as far as I'm concerned, and it ends there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whoever that is, uh, and that's really important because otherwise, as I say, it's it sort of it. There's, there is a sort of an arms race of you know who proves that this and that and I've got this camera and the police have now got overt surveillance that's very overt and covert surveillance at the same time and I've got a mobile phone which is a pity so as I say I I, I, I don't like that I wear it genuinely but it's it's better than not having it I found have you found that you like wear it just going to Tesco no <laughs> I look enough of a knob as it is I don't need to sort of you know <laughs> Amp it uh, up. Um. <laughs> so we've got on uh, a great question here. Hello, Craig Atkinson. Hey, he, Craig. He runs Cafe Royal Books. Yeah. And he'd be a great person to have on one of these. I would love him to do this, but he's asked a question. He said he's late here. I'm not going to put it on the screen because it is quite large and it will take up the whole screen uh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, I'll put it up on the screen. That would be easier if people want to read it. That's fine. He, he said he's late here. So you might have already answered this, but there are lines can be drawn between your work, Dougie's work, uh, meaning Dougie Wallace, uh, Dave Hoffman, and Solomon's, for example, all very different ways of shooting, although similar content and humor in many ways. Obviously, the pictures document aspects of how, but do you ever consider the value the images will have in the future? So I assume uh, Craig means historically as well as monetarily. <laughs> yeah, I just I just say, Craig, I'm a big fan of everything you do. You gave me some advice a few weeks ago, and I'm very grateful for that. But anyone who isn't signed up to Cafe Royal, just sign up. It's brilliant. Yeah. They're cheap. They're cheerful. They're yeah. such good fun. And there's so many amazing photographers who have who have just sometimes it's just little vignettes from from yeah just little stories or vignettes or a set of photos that wouldn't have been published at the time that they did as a personal project or that you sort of think that story's gone now. So and this is John Bulmer, and funnily enough, it's Manchester in the 1970s. Now we it, we we've been talking about this. This this is all about 15 year old me and not being able to have access to photographers and stuff like this. If Cafe Royal Books had been around in 1986 or seven, um, it, this, I would have been all over this and uh, that would have been fantastic. Um, so yeah, they are really cool. And uh, as uh, Joel has said, they're dead cheap and uh, they're fantastic for just, you know, you get, so much it's amazing right i know these these are john bournemouth's ones i've got a couple of others as well but um rather than hold them up at the screen and, and show them all please go to the cafe royal books website go and check out them all you're going to see a bunch of photographers that you really like craig meant yeah he means historic value yeah. i was only I joking sometimes... about the monetary value <laughs> no, but sometimes I don't think photographers necessarily oh, I, I speak of, of a plural photographers i i, I imagine like me, most photographers don't, when they're taking pictures, think, oh, this will be something in 20, 30, 40, 50 years time, because you don't tend to think of something like that in the moment. You're thinking of what is happening today and is this interesting today? And I think it's a shame that actually you don't sort of get to think more. Part of the joy of those those photos, and you look at them and you see that, you know, local newspaper websites are now digging into the archive because nostalgia makes good clicks and it's cheap and easy mm -hmm. to do. But you look at those, it's just the old car in front of the old building and that's what it used to look like. It's just lovely, and it, and you mm. don't think in those terms at the time because it's ordinary for you. There's nothing special about it, so it's 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 hard to think that way. I can think of situations of news photos where I've seen a financial value later on, but also an editorial value as well, um, which is slightly different. I can think of lots of examples of that where I've, I've dipped into the archive and found a picture of of X, Y, or Z that had no value six years ago that had value today massive value um so i think keeping your archive safe is important um yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't think we think about that often enough. And and again, you know, I'm not just saying it. Craig's Craig's output and the way he sort of highlights photographers' work that is the stuff that they maybe did just incidentally or as as, as just as a, as 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 a personal project proves that it, we should think more like that. Um, and you don't want to be pompous about it. You don't want to say, "Oh, I'm shooting for the future," and I'm you know. But we are. We all are. I am listening to you. I'm just trying to find it's a okay, book mate. on my you, shelf because this will you've be got an impressive bookshelf. It's pretty good, right? Uh, I've yeah. got uh, this great book. Sorry, I just uh, had to get some more shelves actually, and I've just shoved them all on the on the. Um, oh, I can't see it. Um, it While you're is... doing that, I'll, I'll tell Craig about the other thing, which is yes, the, the sort of the newsy thing, and then you can sort of have some space to find your book. Um, or your CR book, I presume. I, the, the the editorial value is is a, a really good example of that. Was I was so with the demo stuff. I was also photographing sort of the the the, the Islamist fundamentalist guys, um, and Al Mujahiroon and uh, Muslims Against Crusades, and and so I had lots of pictures of guys at those demos that were just they weren't they were a bit flat. They weren't very interesting. I never filed them. I never published them. And I ended up having pictures of a couple of the guys who went off and did quite horrific things in Syria that with the benefit of hindsight, obviously, and, and the fact that I had access to an archive of photos, I was able to dig out six, seven years after the fact when it suddenly became a news thing. So uh, on an editorial level, as well as on a, on a sort of a, a historical level, I think it's, it's, it's immensely valuable. Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, it was way up there. Uh, the book I was trying to find was this book, it's Glasgow by Raymond Depardon, right? This is an epic class book and it, um, I got into him, but he, they bought this book out and it was all about Glasgow nostalgia. Now I can see uh, a Manchester book uh, along the same lines of Joel. It's Wood. been done. No, I, 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 you know, I mean, um, you know, Which is, um, this is, by the way, an awesome book. So I'll just give it a bit of a plug. I can't even get it on the screen. Glasgow. Raymond Depardon. If you've never heard of him before, he's epic. Now, look, I've just got a few messages on here. Dave Hoffman makes a good point, actually. It was a guy next to him at G20 in 2009 with a helmet cam who caught the policeman knocking my teeth out and gave me the evidence I needed to nail the buggers. So, yes. you know, if you are a press person in, in that kind of world, uh, that's good. So um, there was another comment down here. So <clears throat> a guy stole stole the glasses off my face and screwed them up directly in front of me, not ten months ago, while I was on a night out thing, and he did it directly in front of the GoPro. I don't think he even realised it was there. And as right. soon as the cops turned out, he denied it. He said no. He said I've been stalking his girlfriend who's like twelve and all this sort of rubbish. Um, and within seconds, I was able to prove to the copper that he was lying um and so you know it's it's it was it was it's it's you know yeah absolutely it just it just takes completely the wind out of of, of any sort of accuser's sales this leads to this question on your night stuff do you shoot for yourself hoping the editor will like your images or are you actually shooting or do you shoot for publication feeding them stuff you know will get published yeah. there seems to be a little um, bit of a double-edged soul thought there right <laughs> We sort of touched upon that earlier when we were talking yeah. about, you know, the type of pictures and the style and, and sort of, you know, a lot of the night stuff that gets published that like, makes me uncomfortable. And I and I, I, I think it's a trap. Um, it's a bit of both. And actually, it might depend on my mood. So I might be you. T what I tend to do if I've got a commission already, that sort of puts an extra layer on it. And I sort of count in my head as I'm going, OK, well, that's one picture that's until I sort of and then I relax and I'm about sort of 10 or 12. And I think, OK, well, I've got enough for a gallery now of variety that aren't 10 or 12, you know, of the same thing. And, you know, different people, different places, different scenes, different types of picture. That makes me now comfortable that I can, you know, what what, what different I, I think. Although it's different every time, it's hard if you keep repeating yourself, it then becomes a chore. So you do try and find something different. You do try and do better. I mean, perhaps one of the reasons why I don't do as much now as I did before uh, the, the sort of the 2016 picture is because how do I top that? And I don't necessarily mean the picture, but the response to the picture, um, which is a very big thing. How do I, how do you, how do you do better than that? Um, 
So I think I sort of, I, I, I play it a lot cooler now and I do it a lot less because I want it to be a more special thing. I don't want it to be every, every, every month he's out doing that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I understand totally. So um, it's, it's both is the answer to, to the question. Uh, sorry. Um, I try and think of, of, yeah, I try and think what will sell because I need to earn a living. Um, but I do stop myself from taking certain types of picture. Um, and I do, um, I do want to do better. And I do like the wide stuff with more than one picture. One, sorry, more than one story in the same yeah. frame. Yeah, um, because that's that's satisfying, and 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 I, I, I've got less to prove in that sense. So yeah. So um, you know we're we're doing really well here. We've come up to about an, an hour. If you've got any more questions, Limey. please do put them in the comments box now. I'm gonna talk. We're gonna talk briefly about uh, another subject. Uh, but if you've got any more questions, please do stick them in the comments. If you've got any mates that you think might interest them watching these live photographer interviews or this specific one, please comment and tag your mate underneath. Uh, that's been done quite regularly and that's been really helpful. Thanks ever so much for anybody that's been doing that. I can't name names because I'm uh, my brain is a little bit fried. So back to the interview. So, um, Joel, I want to talk to you about something that happened really recently so we can round this off. We've gone on a nice journey with how your photography as a ph photography career and, and the themes that you cover. Now, uh, obviously, you're based in Manchester. And uh, not long ago, we had the attacks in Manchester. Uh, yeah. Now, as a photographer, press photographer based in Manchester, Spot News, uh, can you explain to us how that came about where you were ended up at the venue uh could you explain a little bit the surround the surround of the, of it and it will give people yeah. a bit more of a perspective of how a press photographer's life is where you literally drop everything and yeah. leg it okay um and it's it's i mean it's an interesting time because we're coming up to the uh, the one year anniversary on tuesday of the of the attack um so um on the night, um, I'd actually already fallen asleep quite early at around about sort of 8 p.m. Um, and I think I just drifted awake at around about, I don't know, after 10. Um, and as you do, or as I do, I sort of had a little, you know, mobile phone by the bed, trawling through Twitter. Um, and just there's general sort of rumors flying around of some sort of bang something going wrong at the manchester arena and it, at the time it sounded like oh it was an electrical explosion a speaker stack whatever had fallen over or something you know electrical failure or something had blown up you know there's lots of high voltage stuff around there presumably um i don't know you know three phase short circuit who knows um but it was just it was just there was something about the way it felt and and as it read off the page that felt like well maybe this is more significant it just it just didn't didn't taste quite you know i'll just ignore that and roll over um and i can't remember i think i had a phone call someone else mentioned it to me as well is there something happening there i have some friends who know that i sort of you know i'm a news photographer and there's something happening in manchester and it just as i say a couple of ways it sort of fed in um and if you're like me as a press photographer you what you'll do at the end of the day the day before is everything will be prepared for the next day so the batteries immediately go on charge, the cards, all the pictures get dumped, they go back in the cards and reformatted before you go to bed, uh, before you even start editing maybe, the first thing you do is put the batteries on charge and dump the pictures and get the cameras back to start from zero mode. Um, so they were all sitting, as they always are, ready to go. Um, and I thought I'll just have a look at it. And as I'm driving in, um, I could see again, there's more stuff sort of happening. I can see there's the police are sort of cordoning off quite far back from the arena. I thought, okay, well, this is a lot bigger than than just you know it, it's too much of a coincidence. Um, and I phoned London News Pictures and they put together a caption for me so that I could transmit off of my camera, um, which is very important actually because with something like that which is big and it was the, the the worst most vague caption ever because we didn't know anything at that point um so it's just you know police are responding to an incident believed to have occurred at the mansion that was it no context at all um 
the police lines meant it was very hard to get close and you, you want to get as close as you can as fast as you can and do as little on foot as possible and I just because it's in an area that I know I knew a side street and with a bit of sort of slightly dodgy driving down a, a, an untrafficked one-way road um, uh, in the wrong direction managed to pop out just near um, the bottom of the arena in Ancoats, uh, not Ancoats, um, it doesn't really matter anyway, um, but anyway just near the bottom of the arena um, and dumped my car on a central reservation by the barriers because again you could at that point I could see something really really horrible had occurred it was no way there would be that much attention um, got out of my car I mean as I'd been forced to stop in in traffic lights and at police cordons I'd been assembling my camera on the passenger seat next to me so the, the lens was on the body and you know so it was basically as I got out of the car lock straight away walking towards it as I get nearer, you can see some messes, ambulances, people all over the place. I remember a guy from the NCP car park who was there, was obviously just helping out, put his hand on my shoulder and said, you don't want to go in there, mate. Um, meaning into the area because it was not pleasant. Um, and I was sort of half on the phone with my headset as he said this to me and sort of, sort of strange sort of, you know, he, he probably thought I was being rude or just ignoring him or, but it didn't matter anyway. Um, and literally I rounded the corner uh, at the bottom of the road that leads up to Victoria Station in the arena is a road called Hunts Bank. It's a steep incline. As I rounded the corner, I, you know, there's injured people there immediately in front of me being sort of assisted and helped and a couple of armed cops sort of moving past me. And obviously there's, you know, people are very distracted. They're not interested in me. I'm not on anyone's radar. And I very quickly, very, very quickly, just took a few pictures on short telephoto at 70 mil da, 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 of a girl being helped, of a man being helped here, and started sort of looking around. And, and I stopped and I thought, okay, let's just quickly send a couple of pictures now. This is serious, this has happened. Um, turn the dongle on, just press transmit on, I think three or four pictures. Um, one of which was one that was published very widely um and then carried on and i think and then obviously just sort of carried on for the night and you, you sort of when you get to something like that you then sort of look at all the different angles and you don't really sort of think at the time what is the impact of this it's it's it is automatic you know once you've done it sort of five or six hundred times shoot picture edit file shoot edit file you sort of switch into a mode of it's not being nasty, it's not being disrespectful, it's just it's a professional mode almost. Um, and it is sort of instinctive. And so I just kept going. And obviously through the night, as the story unfolded and we realized just what a what a horrible thing had happened and, and what a devastating situation it was. Um, I started seeing lots of other photographers about and and you know, within a day the world's media was there. Um, yeah. Sorry, so Evan, that's, you, um, uh, uh, what, yeah, that's fan, that's fantastic uh, background on it. Um, uh, you know, th our um, it's interesting that you describe it. There's this professional mode, pro mode. And it's almost yeah. I would say it's almost there's something a little bit robotic about it. There's this bl very blinkered. All of a sudden, everything else switches off, and you're just there doing the thing you know and there's no peripheral you know you, you're you're just yeah. totally on it and uh, yes <clears throat> unless you've been in that situation you, you especially in a high very intense situation like that where it's there's a lot of adrenaline happening uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff happening in front of you as well that you you do switch into this slower it's almost like your heartbeat goes down one and and you're kind of working and you're not in panic panic is around you and and you're just taking pictures as you go what i'd like to know about is the kind of volume of images that you're taking are you are you blitzing are you scattergunning are you are you uh how are you doing this are you just or are you thinking right you're taking a like you said you're a picture here and a picture here are you being more thoughtful or are you trying to capture as many images as as possible under a on short that night, of time on that night it was quite compressed actually I, I, I in some respects i wish i'd taken more um mm -hmm. you know there are situations where you see where you think i want to get that middle frame 
and I don't know exactly when that middle frame will it will happen during that second, but where in that second, I don't trust myself enough, or frankly, I've got the technology that will make it more likely I'll get it. And so you'll just sit there and you'll burst it and you'll pick the fifth of the eight frames because that's the one where the arms and the eyes and and that's usually something you're waiting for someone to walk out of something or whatever it is and there just might be one that's just spot on um this was I, it wasn't a conscious thing to think this is disrespectful or anything like that because it's not disrespectful um but it just it just it it felt almost intrusive um, you know, every, you know, I, I didn't see anyone who wasn't being cared for because this was outside of the arena. Mm. Um, so, you know, and, and God knows what it would be like to face a situation. You know, the people have faced a lot, lot worse situations where they've been in a great deal more personal danger. And I wasn't. Um, but um, it just, you know, it, it just it didn't feel so it's like drr, drr, so two, three frames of this, two, three frames of that. And then actually I tended not to stay put for very long just because it didn't feel comfortable to do that. So in that location where I got probably the most part of the thing was there weren't lots of pictures that illustrated the damage to humanity that came out of there. And most of them, or those that did, and there are only a couple really that I know of were far too gruesome to publish. Mm. So these were, I guess, if you like, the only, there's only really two or three pictures which show injured people that are publishable. And it just happened that the timing of me getting there and getting, happening to get to that spot um, through knowing the arena. I mean, I photographed gigs at the arena. So I, I, you know, I know the way in, I know the way out. So just for that, and five minutes later, there would have been nothing. And that's why I think the pictures have been published so much is not because I think they're the world's best pictures or anything, but because they're the only pictures that, that illustrate that, that illustrate the harm to humanity that are still publishable. Yeah, I, th I think that's the reason for it. Because um, there's lots of pictures of, of sort of walking wounded and stuff like that, but these are just a bit more emotive, I guess. Yeah, 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 I do understand. I do understand. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent background on that. So how do, how does that make you you know the in your life? And we'll start rounding the the uh, Q and A up now. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this back on the screen. So if anybody's watching who missed this earlier, I'd like you to go and follow um, Joel Goodman on Twitter and Instagram at Pixelate Photo, uh, which you can do right right now on your mobile phone or or whatever and just to round it up is just this press photographer's life again i mean how does that affect your life on a day-to-day -day basis where you're unable to plan uh well you can plan stuff but there's always the the opportunity where things are going to fall over and you're going to have to drop everything and go um how has that affected your personal life out of interest and your family life is there, is there a because of the way that we all work um it is a 24 seven kind of job. Um, yeah, it's stressful. It is stressful, is it? Yeah. I, I don't think, I, you know, I, I, not being self-indulgent here, you know, we've just had mental health awareness week. Um, mm. And I think as a freelancer, but also as press photographers generally, you know, people are, we're highly motivated to do a good job. And sometimes the circumstances, the, the scheduling, the environments are sometimes hostile. Um, there's we're not in hell we're not held in great esteem as, as an institution press photographers uh some of that is our own fault but a lot of that is because people don't separate what other people do with what we do and that's you know we're not good at, at, at communicating that that you know there's there's the, like you said about, like like being asked about sort of recording history but also about doing a job that's that's that is does have incredible value and importance and we're not good at expressing that but we expose ourselves to that a lot and and it seems almost self-indulgent because journalists shouldn't talk about how journalists are journalists should be talking about how other people are that's the job of a journalist mm -hmm. um i think in this context it's 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 safe to say that that it is stressful it is i you know and it's 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 it can hurt um, mentally some people. And I know some people who have taken time out, um, who've been affected by it. Um, and, and 
it comes it does sometimes just the relentlessness there are contexts when you get really really busy and you're massively into something and i find i crash and get ill for a week at the end so mm. i'll work really hard like you know you know several jobs day and night day and night day and night and day and night and as long as i keep going the body keeps going and then i just crash at the end of it and my sleep is all over the shop so in that sense i you know i, I we're, we're our own worst enemies i guess and there's also the motivation <clears throat> not just to keep earning because if you're freelance it might not be there tomorrow and so take it while you can if there's a job on or if there's a commission or whatever but also i think a motivation to want to you know you i became a press photographer one of the biggest things is i wanted to be there at the big event i wanted to be there at the big story i wanted to see that get the main picture of the big event you know that's that's it isn't it it's, it's yeah. being there and getting the big picture of the big event um and who wants to miss what might be the next big picture of the big event so i mean this week i've i've done a lot less than i would normally do and it's been i've been sitting thinking i should be at this i should be at this i should be at this not doing it and it's so i think it's hard yeah yeah i hear this a lot actually from uh, photographers out there uh, we work in a creative industry really and uh, even though in this sector it's press uh, but you know creatives are do struggle with their mental health and and how they um go about their daily routine and how yes. to then manage their uh, personal and business life together is always uh, a difficult you also, thing. I, I keep seeing that. You also like validation. If you're, if you're doing something that's subject to sort of question, is it good enough? Is it not good enough? I mean, if stuff's getting published and you're selling stuff, that's sort of validation in and of itself and it doesn't matter. But you also question yourself. You also question, you know, oh, I've done, I've done shit this job. It eats away at you sometimes when you, when you don't think you're doing well. So on top of all that, you've also got, as you say, something that's creative. Where's the validation coming from? Someone says it's a nice picture. There's a bit there. If it sells, there's a bit there. You know what I mean? But when yeah. you turn out and you don't think you've done a good job or the sales aren't coming in, that can that can bite. Um, yeah, it yeah. comes in waves. Dave, Dave Hoffman makes a good point here. This is a really important aspect that Joel is talking about right now. People should take a look at the Rory Peck Trust website to see how they can help themselves and their colleagues that's yes. that's really good piece of information i, I say this I, i've got to qualify this because there are people who have done far more horrible things in far more horrible environments and have suffered a great deal yeah um, and I, I think we need to talk but but we shouldn't still hold back from discussing things that are every day that are still hurting us every day um yeah. i think that's really important i you know i'm really fortunate in that my one of my my only PR clients as it's such, and I hate doing PR, but this is lovely stuff, is working with a mental health trust. And it's sort of really lovely portraits of people who are brave enough to tell their story and, you know, talk about something that's, the word stigma is used all the time, but it's the, it is the word, to talk about it and be photographed doing it. And that's, and that, so so it's sort of hard in that context to sort of say, well, you know, sometimes it hurts me as well, because these are people who have suffered far worse and there are people who are who are injured and dead um, and kidnapped, um, and it, and I think as photographers we sort of think, well, we shouldn't talk about this because there's people worse off, but there's always someone worse off. Um, mm. I think I think we we put too much pressure on ourselves, and I think that's that's yeah, that's that's it's hard to yeah, talk I've, about. Uh, I see this a lot. I've heard this a lot. It'd be something that I think that as a community that'd be a good thing for us all to uh, talk a lot more about. Actually, that's that's going to yes. make us think about doing some things with potential potential events or potential things online or or more talks and that kind of thing and that's really important joel what, the, the point that you brought up and uh, yeah that's that's really good that's definitely really good so like i'll just put dave hoffman's message back up on the on the screen because if you were watching that it's the rory peck trust website okay go and put it into google because i don't know if it's a dot com or a dot co dot uk right this is second. there also dart as well i think um i tell you who will know a lot about this is jason parkinson and jess hurd who have done sort oh, of, they yeah. do a lot of that sort of work and yeah. they will also be connected with people 